man a faithful servant. When the floor dries, the white line reappears. Three, my grandfathers are in the ground. They are bone and smoothed tree. My last so-so lost her sight. When her mind went, she listened to our voices, hoping to find her own lost thoughts. Lately, she's losing interest. Four, Tomboya Street defies rot. The dust carries all we've buried, calls our memory to the good, to grass, thorn trees, still water. Um, there's a few things you need to know for this poem. Um, Tom Boya um, was a founding father of um, Kenya, a Pan-African trade unionist, um, assassinated shortly after independence. Um, Freedom and After is a collection of his essays and the words of this poem come from this text. Also, Umau is the word for grandfather. Um, he and Tomboya and my grandfather would have been contemporary, so I was trying to find a way to unearth his story. Found, portrait of Umau's early days with Tom Boya's freedom and after. My father knew in his own mind that we were Africans, eyesores to the Europeans. My mother late, he decided I was born to go to school. With complete power over us, the missionaries insisted we must become Christian to read and write. What my father wanted for his children, payment for the way they punished us. So I was sent to a local mission school to be converted, fully accepted as one of them. I still remember how dry it was in the reserve where farmers could own land. It was scrub and thorn trees, soldiers. Evenings, we merely ate and slept. There was no education. The missionaries lived very simply and very tribally. I came to know their language and tribal customs to behave very much like them. By the age of 28, I was known to be good, enlightened. When I became a teacher at a mission school with a wife and family, I determined to have a better standard of life, not a mud and wattle hut with no sanitary facilities and no piped water. Only traveling helped me remember how we were bought, made into investments against Europe's old age. The passionate hopes of my father hunted me in those early years, those sacraments between parents and children. Thank you. Um, Nyayo means footsteps. Uh, and this next poem is a portrait of my childhood um, at certain points growing up in Nairobi. Safe behind the foliage and high white walls of that school built for the children of settlers. Then a tear gas canister blunders in through a window, glass fragments oozing a white smoke that lifts through desks and chairs, rests tears. The uselessness of arithmetic and practiced cursive. Miss Akinyi says, run, and I materialize, materialize outside, watch red and blue dots charge towards the girl's boarding block as blood cells to their lung. I am wearing the same red checkered dress the girls do, grasp my smallness then. I follow, giddily, Dow's face and handkerchiefs at the boarding block tap allow the distraction of water against cement to soothe. We wait, teachers, boys, 
and girls put the trouble beyond the fence to pass. Listen for clues inside our bodies, words to name this hour. In the evening at home, we tell of our valiant escape from riot police and university students, about getting to go upstairs where the boarders sleep. It's the only time we concede the merit of handkerchiefs. Um, this next poem is not so much a portrait of the city, um, but more of an acknowledgement of the many people who don't have access to it um, because of underlying structures we imported upon which the city and nation state depend. This is Paper Trail. 26-year-old star decorates his living room wall with newspaper. The small print cliches like raw cassava, sustenance and poison in flat syntax. In this country, the cut that made a woman of his mother is forbidden. She kept the secret home for nine babies, ignored the redemptive power of hospitals and birth certificates, chose instead to raise a family in the crease of the nation state contract. No high school would, will admit star now that we're civilized. His added sin, the timing of his ambition to pursue enlightenment, infiltrate the white collar economy, become ethereal, stars birthright is the contracting sliver of land fathers pass on to sons, nothing more. In this country, law is a rift valley cliff face, impassable, a provocation for the, ref for the reckless, unless they have rope. You know. There is a windward side to our geography where law is rain buoying the blessed to new life. Had star been born there or baptized? His name would be in the book, telling those who shall inherit the earth. Star is fallen seed, cast out, left behind. At home, inside that fissure, between fruitless visits to the civil registry, Star catches events from beyond the blue by radio signal, each morning the BBC. He reads the newspaper aloud whenever he can, rehearsing for the day a fellow villager blessed with the hospital birth and baptismal certificate opens the celestial gates to citizenship. 2022 is an election year. Um, and as it does every season, um, it takes over the, na the national conversations and every second billboard right now in Nairobi is um, political. <laughs> I share this poem as a gesture to some of the theatrics you will witness. Production values. The year we passed the new constitution, agents knock on our door in Kibra, promise 200 shillings to every woman who attends their campaign rally. For two dollars and change, we and our neighbors show up, sit under their tents on their plastic chairs, raise a dust cloud when the time comes to dance, laugh so gaily, even our teeth turn brown. Journalists record our roar when the stars, the politicians, rise to speak. We let them collage our smiles to the serrated edge of a stamp, politicians at the center. To us, an extra's wage is fair. Who would believe that we'd give up a day's wage to see a live performance of tonight's night show? Ashley. For my last two poems, I want to share a portrait of Nairobi today um, from my neighborhood, um, formerly made up of quaint bungalows and, ma and maisonettes and now the site of furious developments, tall apartment buildings and office blocks, insane traffic, <laughs> um, and our particular ways of coping. A bird perched 
on the power line outside and began to sing. I'd heard her song, but never seen sound emerge from her common orange beak. The olive thrush came to call on creeping cherry tomatoes, enduring gift of long gone neighbors who preferred vegetables to a lawn. As her song swells, I am made worthy of this small rapture. For a moment, the lady downstairs is mute, her laundry soundless. So too, the cacophonous water pumps and the pouring, cutting, grinding next door, another edifice closing in. For now, her song is the world. The volunteer traffic controller on Ring Road, Kilimani. You're fast, it's dark. I'm straining to see your faux policeman's cap, to know whether it's handmade or a Halloween costume cast off. I wish a photograph preserved the dignity exuding from your suit and baton ragged plumage of the officer you are in your heart. Their learned cadence absent from your strut. Without you, we're a flock of feral chickens clucking into the four-way intersection, fighting to nest in that yellow box. Unbidden, you dedicate Saturday night to our willful chaos to keep your mind intact. Forgive me, I'm projecting, mapping out another way to live. Thank you so much. ganz schnell weiter äh, mit äh, der ersten Gesprächsrunde und da bitte ich Theresa Lana und Ingwertilo Marino Marino wieder auf die Bühne. Das wird jetzt moderiert von Alexandra Enchi Boasiaco und es geht um das Thema Social Fabrics, Voices and Sounds of Modern African Cities oder auf Deutsch Sozialgefüge. Stimmen und Klänge der modernen afrikanischen Städte. Und als dritter Gast in der wunderschönen Runde haben wir Professor Dr. Elisio Makabo. Können gerne. Gehen. Lisa, Lola und Ingrid Thielemann habe ich euch schon vorgestellt. Alexandra Enchibo Siako ist Moderatorin aus Hamburg. Im Kontext der Kommunikation versteht sie sich als Architektin, die kommunikative und partizipative Räume gestaltet. Und jetzt bitte ich Professor Dr. Elisio Makamo aus Mosambik auf die Bühne. Oh? Yeah. Ach so! <lacht> Hi. <lacht> um, wow, die sehen alle so wunderschön aus. <lacht> Professor Dr. Elisio Makamo ist Professor für Sozial und Soziologie mit Schwerpunkt Afrika an der Universität Basel und er ist auch Gründungsmitglied der Bayroad International Graduate School of African Studies und für Codestria, Council for the Development of Social Sciences Research in Africa, Dakar, Senegal, bietet er regelmäßig methodologische Workshops für Lusophon und afrikanische Doktoranden an. Viel Spaß bei der ersten Gesprächsrunde.
Good evening, welcome. This panel will be held in English, as you might have suggested, since our wonderful guests from all the way, who made all the way, are English speaking. But I hope the translations are functioning perfectly, and you are very keen and looking forward for, um, how shall I say it? We have a panel with the topic, social fabric, voices, sounds of modern African cities. So here we would like to give impulses discuss their perspectives on what we would consider as a modern African city or if this concept exists in total. So please welcome. I'm so glad that you are all here. Thank you so much to Jumoke for this wonderful introduction. So I do not need to say very much. I've actually planned some sentences but that is not necessary. Let's get to it. So I'm very excited to see you live. We had this free conversation because we were all very excited and felt like, wow, we all here in Berlin in front of you. It's a very wonderful opportunity. So how are you all doing? My first question. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Yes. On behalf of us. Oh, yeah. excellent. Please, can you come a little bit closer to the microphone? We would not like to miss anything of what you said. Wonderful. Teresa, how are you feeling? How is it to read your poems for this Berlin audience? Wonderful, wonderful. Some of these poems I've only ever read once. One of these poems, actually, two of these poems I've never read in person, so it's my first time reading them here because they're new so it was wonderful to finally share them and hear the way the poems speak in their voice. Thank you very much for sharing them, those um, poems and words which were very deep. Quatsi, Mambo. That is all I know. How are you feeling? How is it for you to read those poems? Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here actually. Uh, I think this is my second time at the festival. Um, so, it's always interesting, um, you know, uh, to be, to hear your poems about your home in a different context, yeah. So, let's get started then, right into the question. Teresa, would you like to start? My first question for you would be like, how would you describe the relation to Lagos from a perspective from someone that now actually lives in London and spends um, well, a significant amount of time in London. How does Lagos translate to you in the notion of modern African city with its sounds, voices, or language, or even in your work because you already kind of mentioned Lagos with its traffic? Oh gosh, my relationship. So I um, lived in Lagos for 13 years before I relocated to the UK. And Lagos is a very giant city. I mean, Nigerians in general, we're, you know, our, our music, our culture, our dress and everything is, you know, quite at the forefront of African culture. So you can't miss it. You can't really feel so far from Nigeria. So I don't feel too distant from Lagos. But when I do go back, it's such a bustling city. So much has changed. So much has advanced. But I do find myself sometimes, um, my definition of modernity, like obviously coming from the UK, you do go to Lagos, you're like, where are the undergraduates, where are, the, where are all these things? But I, I think I, I realise that a modern city is one that exploits its own resources. Um, and one, it's, it's very different from the European definition of being modern. And so now I'm starting to really appreciate the steps that Lagos is taking to modernise itself in its own context. Thank you very much. Professor Dr. Elisu Makano. <laughs> Did I say it correctly? Yes, but you can see it again. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand. It must have taken an awful long time to obtain all this high qualification. So, Professor Dr. Elisio Makamo, it's very nice to have you here. So, having lived and worked and studied in various cities in Europe, among like Germany, um, Mozambique, and also the UK, from a sociological, so social. Could you help me with this sociological word? Sociological perspective. Oh, thank you very much. It is so sophisticated and difficult. He deserves his title. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, where would you place the notion of modern African city in that context? 
Well, um, I think I would uh, look at the African city not necessarily as a modern thing, but as a space of possibilities. That's my experience of living here in Europe, that somehow my life is uh, controlled by the city. Whereas my experience of the city in Mozambique and in most African countries is the other way around. It's people who control the city by responding to it, by responding to living with other people and uh, trying to domesticate something that is not necessarily from there. So I think that's where the modernity of African cities uh, lies, uh, not in the infrastructure, uh, not in the extent to which um, these cities reflect our idea of a city, but more in the way in which the city is constantly, every day, built by people. Thank you very much for sharing this kind of perspective and this um, another way of looking at certain things. Because I had, first of all, the impression once you live overseas, once you live over abroad, um, you come to struggle with these two concepts of modernity. So thank you very much for sharing this input or this way of looking at it. Guatilo, my dear, how would you describe your relation to the city of Nairobi um, with the process of unlearning certain perspectives that might be rooted in colonialism, maybe also in other things? Um, I really liked um, the professor's uh, idea of the city as a space of possibility. Um, uh, for me, I, it's always it's a spend, it's a space of tension. <laughs> um, there's this idea of um, the you know this infrastructural development and all the because you you kind of the facade of the city you know these buildings and and you think okay this means we're developing but then where is the space for the people. Um, and what is the, like, is, is this facade useful to us? Um, and so, you know, it's always this tension between who is it for, um, who are we posturing for, um, um, but also we are getting to a space where we're starting to realize we need to do things for our, ourselves, like it's not about what, uh, what we're benchmarking with you know, Britain, <laughs> but also what's useful for us. And that's, I think that's where the tension is because some of us still like, we want to look <laughs> like that, but what is useful for us? In terms of, I like as well the phrase of um, possibilities, which is something to be stressed out very much because if I look at the outcome of different various African cities, speaking of Lagos, generally Nigerians input creatively, culturally, business-wise, it is still quite, let's say, unknown. We, of course, we have mainstream artists that kind of flooded flooded obviously finally <laughs> the dance floors but also in terms of business opportunities the startup scene of Lagos for instance is immense so I like this one as well but how would you say the balance the struggle that African cities have with modernity of how perceived under western eye and modernity in the sense of it is okay if we do not try and build a very high tower because maybe it is not sustainable enough to run a lift that goes 20 floors up. How do you feel like, how, how far are we along? How do you feel it for your individual cities? Fair enough. Um, I think for, for Lagos, so people, when people think of Nigeria, they think of oil, but this year alone, the GDP of um, the tech industry has surpassed the GDP that the um, oil industry has contributed to Nigeria, basically. And so the tech industry seems like it is going to be the main source of, you know, income for, for Nigeria. So it's, it, it just shows just how far that is growing and the amount of investment that people are putting into the, the tech industry from um, Paystack to Flutterwave and, and so many other solutions to basically the private and public sector. Um, in terms of, you know, Lagos as a city trying to not 
mimic the, the British and really think about themselves. And thinking about skyscrapers, for example, so um, there's the um, echo, um, what they call it, echo, um, Trying to, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it's Echo Atlantic, basically on the Atlantic Ocean, that trying to reclaim the land and build skyscrapers there. Um, I personally don't think that that should be the priority. I think the priority should be focusing on the the houses that are already on the coastline and trying to develop that. You know, giving them sanitation, giving them access to water, access to electricity. That should be the priority rather than trying to build skyscrapers for who when those people there already there can't basically afford it so um yeah so i think that lagos is going uh, in a good direction so at the moment there is development on the um, um sea transportation so they've now um, introduced the whole line of boats manufactured by lagos manufacturers um, so they are going in the right direction but there have been some mistakes but i think you have to keep going and just trial and error trial and error Shall I whisper? My question was in general, how would you feel the struggle between the benchmark, as you mentioned it so well, how strong is the struggle? I'm already at the point I'm doing what favors me as a person, as a nation, as a culture, or am I trying basically to be better than previous colonialists or the images that we have from the West in that sense? Um, so in Nairobi, uh, just last month, we, lost, we launched an expressway um, and it's like a very big deal that hopefully will win somebody an election. I don't know. <laughs> um, like I said, we are always, we are in this place between um, uh, posturing, you know, we also just did the railway line that we've been doing for like, I don't know and how much money. <laughs> um, M-Pesa though, in terms of just actual examples, tech is also huge in Nairobi. Um, it's, you know, we talk about the Silicon Savannah, there is also some um, red herrings <laughs> in, in that mix, but we are, um, we are in a space where we're like reimagining what the city is for um, and like, it's 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 one thing to talk about like the um, these structural things, but for me it's also the people. Um, like, what's the energy that we are bringing to the fore? Um, especially, I mean, yes, in terms of tech, it is it's people. You know, M-Pesa would be nothing if if people weren't using it um, and and finding it useful. From like people in complete rural um, Kenya to people in the city. Like, I mean, at this point, cash is almost useless because, I mean, like, we skipped cards. We, we just, we're just on the phone. Um, it's, it, that's the energy. I mean, everything, even the, the film space, um, culturally, like, it's, it's the people, and because we're so young, um, um, or the population is so young, I'm not that young. <laughs> um, yes, you are. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's driving um, our progress, it's driving um, even what we see, I think in the West we see a lot of dependence, um, and it, I, it's a difficult word, dependence on the, what the government does and that leadership that it provides, We've been knowing that we've been on our own f for a long time, <laughs> and there's things that the government should do, and you know, um, it, it pulls us back because you know, healthcare, um, some social services, water, as you say, um, but the ingenuity of people to provide solutions and 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 thrive in spite um, of this failure of structures, I feel like is the is the hope. Thank you so much for this, um, yes, very encouraging words, but also very eye-opening. How would you see it from this perspective? Would you like me to repeat the question, Professor Dr. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, being a professor means that you have to have a good memory. <laughs> and then pretend that you lost it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I think, you know, there's a, there's a problem um, that uh, we face in Africa 
and I think this is what Winston was talking about in his introduction. And, and that is that we live in a European world, mm -hmm. and so we have to find our way in that world. What that means for urban settings is that we have a model of the ideal uh, city. And so when we look for solutions to our problems, we always look for them in that model. And we neglect the creativity of our people. They are so creative, but um, we, we ignore uh, how they are responding to the city. And then we do more things according to that model. And people respond to what we do. And in doing that, we move further and further away from that model, and we don't see it. So, I mean, this is the one thing that I find so exciting about African urban spaces, and in particular uh, about Maputo, uh, the capital city of Mozambique. Um, there's a fascinating spot uh, in Maputo. There's a traffic light. Um, and it's so wonderful. It took me uh, many years uh, to know how to deal with them uh, because um, um, red, amber, and green do not have the same meaning that they have here. Right? So uh, sometimes red can be green. <laughs> it depends on how long uh, it stays amber. Right. So like if it takes two minutes um, and then it turns to uh, red, you know it's green. <laughs> and it goes on like that, I can't, uh, I can't remember, because I just follow the people uh, when I'm there. Uh, so that, that is, of course, I'm not saying that uh, uh, this is how we should manage our traffic uh, in our uh, cities, but I'm saying there's something uh, about the way we live and about the way we respond to the circumstances of life which uh, our politicians should take into account. Thank you very much. Um, I can see or I can tell there's actually so much more to, to discuss and so much more to explore. But the key points that all three of you have said first that um, when you consider African cities and I now consciously leave out the modern when we speak about African cities, that it is more the people who who are the, the striving force, whereby when we see Western concept politicians, leadership are rather the striving force, and maybe if they are crippling or not crippling, it's left to decide for someone else. But there's one specific thing that you mentioned for your, for your designated cities, um, people and their creativity actually is uh, one thing that you notice as the striving force and I totally agree even though certain things like how many of you do know how mobile money functions is something that in Germany well PayPal is coming and that was wow that's the max but it is something that kind of um, and yes it just jumped in an African country mobile money went straight there was no desktop version we are not at this point digitally at all in fact in Germany as um, certain circumstances which I do not have to mention the last two years have unearthed even more uh, let's say um, there is more potential to improve for the digitalization here but these are kind of things people are not aware how many fintechs are coming up how many how many ways to trans tra yes it is sheer amazing and there could be another panel just on these kind of topics on these kind of business leaderships and VCs and how much money runs through African cities and that sense so so thank you first of all for being our guest here thank you for sharing your poems your your knowledge your expertise as a professor doctor it's not every day that this happens thank you for your beautiful poems where they were very personal and yet you were here and presented them so openly and therefore our greatest appreciation and thanks. Thank you very much.